check. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Leanne. I am the educational coordinator here at the People's Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all to the space. A few quick logistical things before we start. There's uh, bathrooms here and around the corner. Um, and then also, as you're moving around, if you need to get up, please be mindful we are live streaming and recording the event from multiple cameras. Um, most of them concentrated right here directly in front of me, so please uh, be mindful not to bump them or uh, stand in front of them for too long. Uh, briefly, for those of you who have not been here before, the People's Forum is a movement incubator for working class and marginalized communities. We provide political education and cultural programming for, um, for, to, for the goal of building unity across lines of division, both here and abroad. For this reason, we are beyond honored and humbled to have Ahmed Abortema, Jihad Abu Salim, and Amy Goodman here with us tonight. <laughs> The 11-year blockade on Gaza has not only caused incomprehensibly severe and extreme hardship on millions of Palestinians, but also has severely limited the, way, the opportunities for activists and organizers all around the world to connect with people who are actually struggling and resisting on the ground in Gaza. So for us, this is a really rare and important and, uh, opportunity. We are so thankful that this is happening. Thank you to the organizers who worked so hard to make this happen. Um, thank you also for Ahmed and Jihad who have been traveling tirelessly with no breaks for many weeks to reach as many of us as possible. Uh, <laughs> thank you also to Amy for taking time out of her incredibly busy, busy schedule to be here with us. And Most importantly, thank all of, I thank to all of you for being here on a Thursday evening. Um, we know this is going to be enriching and, and very nourishing for all of us. And I, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Jihad. Good evening. It's so good to be back in New York City. Um, I'm, I'm an expat of New York somewhere else now. <laughs> um, I would like to thank the great local organizers of this event who made it possible and who put um, a lot of work into uh, making this moment uh, happen. I'm really honored tonight. I'm honored because I'm, I'm sharing this beautiful space, the People's Forum space with you all. I'm honored to be in your presence. Thank you for taking the time and joining us tonight and, and being part of the conversation. Um, it's also an honor to share this stage with Amy Goodman. Um, what an honor. Amy's work has advanced media and journalism in this country. Um, and as a Palestinian, I'm grateful for, always, for you for always giving Palestinians a platform, especially in times when our narrative is made absent and rendered invisible. So thank you. My name is Jihad Abu Salim. I'm Palestinian from a small town uh, south of Gaza City called Deir al-Balah. I moved to the U.S. five years ago to start a PhD in history and Hebrew and Judaic studies here at NYU. Um, my research focuses on Arab and Palestinian intellectual writings, on uh, Zionism, anti-Semitism, and the plight of the Jewish people in Europe before 1948. Um, and I lived in New York for four years, and, I, and New York was home and community for me, and I, and I miss it so much, and I'm really happy to be back tonight. Um, so I moved to Chicago almost a year ago, and Chicago is, um, is home to a large Palestinian community. And shortly I, after I moved to Chicago, I, uh, I was lucky to join the uh, Palestine-Israel program at the American Friends Service Committee. Um, and at AFSC, I joined a wonderful team of organizers and a team that does work on Palestine and beyond that extends from the Bay Area to Amman. Um, we have uh, offices in Gaza, Jerusalem, Amman, um, Chicago, uh, and the Bay Area. And um, our team has been doing work on Palestine, BDS, and many other issues for a long time. Um, our work focuses on addressing Palestinian fragmentation 
by providing spaces for Palestinians to talk, to, to exchange their ideas and experiences, and to connect with each other um, against the odds of separation and physical, uh, and physical barriers uh, that exist uh, as a result of occupation and as a result of um, the Palestinian ref refugee experience in the diaspora and also within Palestine itself. We also work with faith communities and with churches and with many groups on advancing the uh, issue of Palestine and awareness on, on the issue as well. Um, we not only seek to raise awareness, but we also seek to shift policy in the U.S. by uh, engaging in congressional and advocacy work um, on uh, uh, n national and also local levels. Um, Currently, our Chicago uh, office works on, focuses on two campaigns in addition to a lot of uh, other uh, uh, work that we do. The first campaign, No Way to Treat a Child, um, which uh, is a campaign that addresses the issue of detention and torture of Palestinian children and led to the first proactive bill in U.S. history in support of Palestinian human rights, the, Biddy Mac uh, Senate, uh, the Congresswoman Betty McCollum Bill H.R. 4391, which we hope it will be re reintroduced this year. The other campaign we have, um, and which is at the center of our focus, is called Gaza Unlocked. You will find a lot of uh, some literature um, at the front uh, about Gaza Unlocked. And this campaign seeks to raise awareness in the U.S. on Gaza and, to, and also seeks advocating to end the brutal blockade that rendered uh, life in the Gaza Strip un, uh, unbearable. So I started working with AFSC around the same time the Great March of Return began to unfold in the Gaza Strip last year. And my experience working there for the first time in this kind of field in the U.S. Um, has been defined by the unfolding of the march. And as the march was unfolding in Gaza, my colleagues and I were left with many questions about what the march meant and still means for Palestinians and for the Palestine rights movement here in the U.S. In July of 2018, I wrote an article for the Journal for Palestine Studies exploring and examining questions um, about what the march meant for Palestinians um, as it happened in a context of a fragmented Palestinian body politic, blockade and occupation. The Great March of Return highlighted the Palestinian refugee plight and the decade-long blockade on Gaza. The march was and is still a rare opening for Palestinians in the Gaza Strip to reclaim a factionally controlled political sphere and to um, engage in uh, political action. Um, what was unique about this art article and engaging with these questions is that um, the article was based on an interview, a very detailed interview, with our guest tonight, Ahmed Abu Rtema. I interviewed Ahmed back in July, and, and Ahmed is the writer whose writings inspired the Great March of Return. And as I was talking to him, I realized that the march, the Great March of Return, as a, as a moment of Palestinian mass popular mobilization, is a product of an interesting conversation that is taking place in Palestine in general, but also in Gaza in particular, amongst a, a young generation that hopes to move beyond the stalemates of our time and of their time. Um, our guest tonight, Ahmed, is part of this conversation and one of the main contributors to it back there. At AFSC, we realized how, Im how important it is to bring this conversation here because how can we, as a Palestine rights movement, as Palestinians in the U.S. and as friends and allies of Palestine, how can we move further with our struggle without connecting with uh, and keeping up with these conversations and discussions that are happening in the homeland? People in the homeland in Palestine, especially in Gaza, have suffered from long years of isolation. Their voices are not well represented here, even within our movement simply because it's almost impossible to get, the, to, get to the Gaza Strip and to bring people here. Um, I personally haven't been able to, to be back in Gaza since 2013, since I left because of the blockade. Um, so when reading the article and reading Ahmed's writings and, and looking at the march from here, we, um, we had a, a simple dream. 
we said to ourselves, what if we invite Ahmed to the U.S.? Back then, in summer 2018, this idea sounded like something that is not uh, going to be achievable, especially in the Trump era and given the complications that face people traveling out of Gaza. I've known Ahmed for almost a decade through social media, uh, where he mostly writes and where the, these important conversations are happening. And we met briefly in Gaza uh, once in 2011. Ahmed, who I will have the honor of introducing uh, him shortly, he's an intellectual in the true sense of the word. He writes about the people and for the people, um, and his message is universal. He writes in a very poetic but yet accessible uh, language um, about faith, social issues, political issues, social justice, and the future in Palestine uh, and Israel. His writing is a mirror that helps people in Palestine reflect on their reality and aspire for a better world and a better reality for themselves and for their children. Ahmed's voice, like many voices, unfortunate, is unfortunately under blockade. The blockade, we Palestinians from Gaza, chases us even here. Um, but what sounded like a dream for us at AFSC in the beginning, to invite this, per, this great writer whose writings inspired this great moment of mass popular mobilization. Um, what sounded like a dream is now a reality, and Ahmed is here with us tonight. Um, Ahmed arrived in the US in January, and since then, he's been part of um, many conversations here about various struggles, movements, and histories um, in and of this land. He, we visited Detroit and spoke to uh, black activists and organizers. We just came from New Mexico, where we met with indigenous uh, people, with indigenous activists and organizers, and heard their stories and learned about their histories. Um, and before that, we went to the US-Mexico border, um, uh, especially uh, in, in south of San Diego, an area that was very um, re reminiscent and, and reminded us of the southern border of Gaza, the border that meets land and sea and, and uh, is, a, is a constant reminder of our isolation. And when we went to the U.S.-Mexico border, we participated in a service on a Sunday where people prayed on both sides of the, of the wall, of the fence. And that was the first time I, you know, we managed to uh, to speak to people from the other side of the fence, and and we like, we were really affected and touched by the similarities, um, and we were able to draw a lot of similarities based on that experience. In every stop of our tour, we so far we visited Boston, Chicago, Detroit, Madison, uh, the Bay Area, uh, San Diego, and we just came from New Mexico. And on, in every stop, we met with Palestinian American community members, leaders, and organizers. We, um, and it was very emotional and touching for us, this one people, to finally feel what it means for us to talk about our issues and to share our, um, our experiences and what does it mean for us to be Palestinian and how do we imagine our struggle and our future. We also met with members of Jewish communities all over the places we went to. And those were very fruitful and, 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 and amazing conversations that we had. We spoke at universities, churches, synagogues, and at people's houses. Um, we have been on the run since March 1st. Um, and also we have been overwhelmed by how much love and support we have been receiving since we uh, started this tour. So, um, before I introduce Ahmed, I just I would like to raise your attention to a very small uh, thing that AFSC is doing today. So AFSC has a youth program in Gaza that, unlike many NGOs that work there, does work on identifying the needs of Palestinians uh, in Gaza, uh, especially when we think about doing aid work. So our youth program. Um, has recently ident identified a pressing need amongst Palestinian elderly in the Gaza Strip. The, the, the first children of the refugees who were expelled in 1948, 30% of whom are widows. And those elderly are the, they're the least recipients of, any for, of all, almost all forms of humanitarian aid in the Gaza Strip. Um, they, they have 
pressing needs, uh, medical, uh, they need you know, assistance to maintain a dignified life as they are um, coping with, with their age and with, with, uh, with the situation in Gaza. So we issued an appeal to call upon people to donate to help those old people in Gaza and they will receive products that are only bought uh, from the Gaza Strip from uh, local businesses. So for, if, if you'd like to contribute and if you know people who would like to contribute to that appeal, please visit uh, afsc.org slash give to number two Gaza, give to Gaza. And you will find more information and, um, and uh, uh, more details on how to donate and how to contribute um, uh, in the front. So I'm going to introduce Ahmed in, in two ways. The first will be formal, and the second I will tell you about in a minute. So Ahmed Abortema is a Palestinian writer and activist who believes in civil nonviolent struggle to achieve justice, freedom, and equality. Ahmed's family was expelled from their home in the Ramla district in 1948, and he was born in 1984 in Rafah uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, where he now lives with his wife and his four children, who, who he hasn't seen since November since we started working on getting him to the US. As an independent journalist in Gaza, he has written for dozens of publications and authored a book in Arabic called Organized Chaos. He also contributed to several documentaries, including the Al Jazeera film, Which Rafah Are You From?, about the tragic separation of Rafah following the Camp David Accords and its impact of displacing thousands of families, including his own. In 2018, he was featured in a documentary film by Karim Shah, produced by Al Jazeera News Network, Gaza Between Fire and Sea. His visionary writings about nonviolence inspired the Great March of Return. So that was the formal introduction. Um, but now what we're going to do, um, Ahmed comes from a world of walls and fences. And sometimes it's hard for us to imagine what does that mean. Um, but also Ahmed comes from a world of agency and resilience and strength. And it's, and it's, it's hard also to, to imagine how do contexts of suffering and misery um, make people stay resilient and, and, and powerful in face of these tremendous challenges. So um, our friends at the Institute for Middle East Understanding, IMEU, worked on a really beautiful video that takes us on a very short journey, three minute uh, journey to Ahmed's world, where we will meet him, we will meet his, his children, and we will see uh, how they have been um, living uh, uh, surrounded by these walls and fences, but yet blooming with so much love and positivity and, 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 and hope for a better world for all. So I'll leave you with that and then we will continue or uh, I will invite Ahmed to the stage after the video. Thank you so much. مسيرة العودة بدأت بحلم كنت أنا وأصدقائي من قرب من السياج العازل شرق قطاع غزة رأينا العصافير يعني تقطع هذا السلك مجيئا وذهابا صديقي الذي كان معي يقول لي انظر هاي بلادنا المحتلة عن 48 فنقول فقط يعني فقط عشرات الأمطار تفصلنا بيننا وبينها فيعني سجلت خاطرة في ذلك اليوم على الفيسبوك لماذا لا نكون مثل العصافير على أننا لا تعترف بهذا السلك كانت لي قصة باكرة مع الفصل أنا ولدت في مدينة رفح ونشأت فيها كانت مدينة واحدة عام 82 كان هناك اتفاق بين إسرائيل ومصر برعاية الإدارة الأمريكية في ذلك الوقت بوضع الأسلاك الشائكة هذه الأسلاك الشائكة مرت في داخل البيت الواحد فقسمت بعض البيوت يعني غرف في رفح المصرية وغرف في رفح الفلسطينية 
والدتي بقيت في رفح المصرية ووالدي في رفح الفلسطينية أي أن 150 مترا حين وصلت لوالدتي استغرقت 19 عاما أنا شخصيا يعني نالني جزء كبير من هذه القصة أراضينا الجميلة على بعد مئات الأمتار منا غير معقول أن 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 يظل ملايين اللاجئين يعيشون في سجن حقيقي يعيشون في حصار كتبت خاطرة ثانية قلت فيها ماذا لو اجتمع مئتا ألف لاجئ فلسطيني بطريقة سلمية ووقفوا جميعا بطريقة سلمية بقرب من السياج العازل وقالوا نحن نريد العودة إلى ديار ماذا ستفعل دولة الاحتلال؟ تفاعل بقوة ليس لأن هناك قوة طاقة سحرية في المنشور ولكن لأنه جملة الظروف التي يعيشها الناس هناك حالة خنق وحصار غير مسبوقة اشتداد لهذا الحصار القطاع الخدماتي منهار القطاع الاقتصادي منهار المعبر مغلق لا رواتب لا عمل لا أفق مسيرة العودة أعادت العافية والحيوية للقضية الوطنية أظهرت صورة الشعب برجاله وبنسائه وبعجائزه وبشيوخه يقف وجها لوجه في مواجهة جنود الاحتلال أيضا عزز ثقافة العودة في نفوس الشباب وفي نفوس اللاجئين هؤلاء الشباب هناك كثير من العائلات هنا في قطاع غزة لم يكونوا يقتربوا من السلك العازل الآن كسرت هذه الهيبة التي حاول أن يفرضها الاحتلال حاول أن يفرضها بالخوف علينا اليوم العالم عليه أن يقوم بمسؤوليته الأخلاقية عليه أن يقرر هل من الطبيعي أن يكون في القرن الحادي والعشرين دولة تقيم الجدران العنصرية وتمارس الاضطهاد العنصري هذا الوضع غير قابل للاستمرار نحن نريد أن نرجع إلى ديارنا وحسب ولا مشكلة بعد ذلك أن نعيش في دولة واحدة وفق حقوق متساوية لا مشكلة في ذلك نحن قضيتنا ليست قضية إغاثات ولا قضية إعاشة وحسب نحن قضيتنا أن نريد أن نعيش بحرية And without further ado, please welcome Ahmed Abortema. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you for the organizers of this uh, event, and thank you for AFSC for organizing my speaking tour in United States. Brothers and sisters, I come to you from a place where living is a success story. My being in front of you today is evidence of how lucky I am compared to many fellow Palestinians who never traveled even once in their lives. I came to you from the Gaza Strip, which is a small part of Palestine. It's a narrow strip of land with an area of 141 square miles. 2.2 million Palestinians live there, making it one of the highest population density territories in the world. About 75% about of the residents of the Gaza Strip are Palestinian refugees expelled by Israel in 1948. Gaza is a real prison. It links with the outside world through two crossings for Gaza residents. The first is in Rafah, south of Gaza, on the borders with Egypt. This crossing is known for its long delays. Many people wait months to leave. In 2017, for example, the Rafah crossing opened only for 29 days throughout the entire year.
My attempts to travel started six years ago. I was always told that travel permits are only granted to people who have a strong justification to leave. I would get angry when I heard about these restrictions. I would say, I'm a human being who has the natural right to move freely. I want to explore the world and meet people from diverse cultures and countries. Isn't this enough of a justification for me to travel? My attempts to travel finally succeeded after I received an invitation from the United Nations Human Rights Council to visit Amman. And there I applied for my, my first US visa based on an invitation from AFSC. My first thought after I left Gaza was how happy I felt that I would be able to travel freely at last. It felt great to travel in the car without reading a sign that says the area in which you are allowed to move has ended. It was a beautiful feeling to move freely without seeing fences or walls. Dear sisters and brothers, on the 9th of December 2017, three days after President Trump announced he's going to move the embassy to occupy Jerusalem goods. I went for a walk with my friend Hassan near the fence separating the Gaza Strip from Israel. My friend Hassan pointed, pointed towards the east saying, look, this is the fence separating us from our villages from which our families were expelled. I was amazed that this fence imprisons 2.2 million people in the narrow Gaza Strip, preventing them from a freedom of movement and a normal life. That night, I posted on my Facebook. It was the moment before sunset. I looked at the birds and I saw them moving between the trees on both sides of the fence and no one stopped them. How easy the matter is. Birds decide to fly, so they fly. What if one of us imagine himself a bird and then decide to reach a tree beyond the fence? If that person was a Palestinian, once they reach the fence, an Israeli bullet will hit his body. Why do we complicate the simple matters? Isn't it the right of humans to move freely like birds? What danger toward peace would a human create if he or she decided to wander in nature? On that day, I discovered the real reason to hate the occupation. I hate it because it disrupts my evening walk because it's against the laws of nature. It eclipses my wings. It kills my dreams. At the beginning of 2018, the Israeli blockade imposed on the Gaza Strip was making for Palestinians worse than ever. The destruction of health services, the cutting of employees' salaries, the paralyzed economy, and the continuation of the closure made life impossible. I wrote another Facebook post where I suggested that 200,000 Palestinians gather peacefully near the fence to demand a life with dignity and to return to their lands and homes according to the United Nations Resolution 194. In this post, I said, that we are people who want life and nothing but life. We die in our besieged narrow strip. So why don't we move before we all die? I ended this post with a proposed hashtag, the great march of return. Many people answered this call. They did so because 75% of Gaza's residents 
are Palestinian refugees who were expelled by force from their villages and cities that are just beyond the fence. People answer this call because the Gaza Strip, according to the reports of the United Nations, won't be livable in 2020, next year, because of the collapse of basic human services. People answer the call for peaceful protest because their desire for life was stronger than despair. The Great Marsh represented a scream for life and a knock on the walls of the prison after these besieged prisoners decided not to accept the continuation of a slow death. On March 30 last year, the day the Great Marsh of Return was launched, tens of thousands of Palestinians peacefully protested near the fence. On that day, women, men, elderly and children together participated in the marsh and raised the keys of their houses in Israel, which they kept since 70 years. And Palestinians still protest every Friday for almost a year. They raised the Palestinian flags and said, we want to return. We want a dignified life. We want human rights like the rest of all people and nations of the world. What did Israel do to face those peaceful protesters? Israel opened fire at them and shot them with explosive life bullets, killing on that day and until this day more than 250 Palestinians, 25,000 more have been injured. Many of them lost their limbs. Among the victims of the return march were medics, journalists, women, and children. Maybe some of you have heard the story of the paramedic Razan al-Najjar, who was killed by an Israeli bullet to her chest. Razan, a beautiful young woman, volunteered to help the wounded at the protests. She was wearing the white uniform of paramedics when she was killed, somehow thinking that her uniform would protect her in the eyes of an Israeli sniper. The Israeli army killed Razan and killed her dream of a human world where peace prevails. I visited Razan's mother, who told me about her daughter. Razan was from a, f a poor refugee family from the village of Salama near Jaffa. Her dream was to return to her village Salama. She had a loving heart. Her mother told me that she once asked Razan, Razan, what if you saw an injured Israeli soldier while you are helping the wounded Palestinians? Razan answered, I will help him with no hesitation. My mission is a humane and doesn't distinguish and doesn't distinguish between people. Why does Israel target and kill peaceful protesters? It kills them because it wants to target the will to live, the will to resist the occupation in the spirit of the Palestinian people. The protesters raised their voice after 70 years of attempts to silence us. The March of Return sends a message that millions of refugees must return simply because this is their right. Sisters and brothers, the return of refugees is not a theoretical question. It's also practically achievable. 85% of lands on which refugees lived before Israel expelled them in 1948 is still either empty or with low population density. 
if the world had the will, it would be able to put an end to the tragedy of those millions of refugees and co compensate them for their losses. We want a solution based on the foundation of justice, equality, and freedom. A country where indigenous Palestinians coexist with their Jewish neighbors according to the values of citizenship, equal rights, and the implementation of international justice. While the Jewish people have a right to live in peace and security, it's not fair or just to solve a tragedy by creating a new one. Sisters and brothers, can you imagine that in the 21st century, there are states that imprison millions of people within walls and fences and deprive them of their human rights, kill them and get away with taking their lands and resources. Can you imagine that there are states that discriminate between people on the basis of their ethnicity, religion, and gender, and not, to, uh, not on the basis of a human equality. Just a few days ago, Benjamin Netanyahu tweeted that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and them alone. It's not a state of all its citizens. This means ending the hopes of millions of refugees who still struggle since 70 years to achieve the international right to return home. Sisters and brothers, in the era of human progress and the growing resistance against walls and the era of a growing human connection, we in, Palestine, we in Palestine still suffer under occupation, colonialism and separation fences. Human contact leads to overcoming the psychological bar barriers and to more understanding, empathy, and more love, all lead to peace Imprisoning, imprisoning millions of Palestinians behind walls is not only a crime because it prevents them from food and medicine. It's a crime because it prevents them from contact with their larger human family. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine how people live in Gaza? If you were a young person in Gaza, you may turn 35 years old without ever getting a job, a place of your own to live, or be able to get married. To be a father in Gaza often means you feel ashamed because you are unable to provide food for your family. To be ill in Gaza means waiting for many months to get an Israeli permit in order to exit and receive medical treatment. You would be lucky if you didn't die while you waited for your permit. To live in Gaza means that you will live without electricity. We only have access four or six hours of electricity. Then it cuts off for 12 to 16 hours. To be a young person in Gaza means you spend your whole life without seeing a river or a mountain or a lake. You won't take the train or connect with people from different countries who speak different languages. You won't even see a civilian plane in the sky carrying passengers. Since I left Gaza, I'm still excited every time I see a plane in the sky. I stop and stare at the plane until it disappears 
in the horizon. In Gaza, we see planes in the sky, but only Israeli military planes. The sound of the planes is linked in the hearts of people to death and horror. It's hard for us to imagine that the planes are symbols of life and the human progress. Brothers and sisters, I as a Palestinian refugee suffer like the rest of my fellow Palestinians from expulsion, occupation, blockade, and aggression for more than 70 years. It's my right to return to the town of Ramla, from which my family was forcibly expelled in 1948. It's my right to live in dignity and equality because I am a human being. It's my right to enjoy freedom for movement and travel. It's my right to enjoy the opportunity of education and employment that would enable me to live normally, to be able to bring my children basic food, clothes, or toys. It's my right not to see the fence of death, caging me and millions of people, preventing us from moving, move, moving and, their, and our natural human rights. Is it too much to be liberated from behind these walls and fences? Brothers and sisters, we are all partners in one struggle for the sake of step, establishing justice and combating injustice everywhere. Let us work together for the sake of making our world a better, more stable for all people. Let's struggle to create an era of equality and human rights for all. In a world of justice, and equality, we could use our resources to build a better life for all and not for purposes of war and aggression. Money should be used for healing, not for killing. Money should be used for education, not for occupation. A world where people live connected and safe will be better for everyone, much better than a world of fences, walls, and fears. Brothers and sisters, let us stand in the right side of history for a better future for our children. We struggle today for freedom, dignity, and justice for all people, for all people. Thank you. Well, Ahmed and Jihad, you've been on quite a journey to get to this place tonight. Aside from driving through the night because you couldn't go through Denver because of the snowstorm last night and driving to El Paso and getting to two planes uh, to be here this evening. Um, I wanted to start with how you ended up being able to come, Ahmed, to the United States. This is your first trip here? Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, I came here uh, after I received an uh, invitation from AFSC to share in a speaking tour in United States, States to uh, connect with people about our cause and to learn from them about their causes here because we have one struggle for equality and for justice. So uh, I, I, I tried to, uh, lift, uh, to leave Gaza since six years without success. Finally, uh, I received an invitation from United Nations Human Rights Council to meet with, uh, 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 with me in Amman. So this invitation helped me. After I finished my meetings in Amman, I received uh, a formal invitation from AFSC. Then I applied uh, my visa to United States, and I came here. What was the conversation like in the U.S. Embassy in Amman? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they asked me, why, why will you go to U.S.? I uh, answered them uh, to share in a speaking tour about the human rights and about justice, equality. And uh, 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 they have uh, um, 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 a main uh, worry about the immigration. So uh, I told uh, them I have my family in Gaza and I live them in Gaza and my children in Gaza. And I showed them uh, the invitation from AFSC. The invitation, uh, I think it was uh, convinced to them. And uh, she asked me, what, what do you do? I answered, I'm a writer. She asked me, uh, where you, uh, do you write? I answered, I write in many websites, uh, including Al Jazeera sometimes. And uh, I wrote an article in the New York Times. Uh, then uh, she, she gave me the approval. <laughs> Uh, a New York and, Times and fan. Yeah, and the, I, I think the second uh, article to me in, in New York Times will be uh, will be after a few days from today. Where you grew up in Rafah, you were separated from your mother for almost two decades. Yeah, uh, uh, Rafah separation is. Uh, is a sad story. It's actually one of hundreds of, of sad stories in the in Palestinians' life. Uh, so, in 1982, after uh, Israel pulled out from Sinai, they put uh, a fence in Rafah, then separated it to Egyptian Rafah and Palestinian Rafah. Uh, this fence. Uh, 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 separate even the the one house and the one farm. So part of the of, of the fence, uh, uh, part of the house became Palestinian and the other part uh, became Egyptian. Uh, and uh, thousands of families uh, were splitting because of this fence. Uh, my family was one of the, those families. After that fence, uh, my uh, I, I born after this uh, this fence. Uh, uh, then uh, I uh, uh, I raised for uh, my my first two years in my life in my mother's house. She was in Egyptian Rafah, and she and my father uh, were di divorced. Uh, then after two years, I uh, uh, the, my my father's family. Uh, uh, took me uh, to uh, uh, Palestine and Rafah, and there is a border and a crossing. It's not easy to move easily between the, the two parts. Then I spent in my father's uh, home for 19 years without, uh, without b uh, going back to Egyptian Rafah. The first time I was able to visit my uh, mother's ho home was in uh, September 12, 2005, when the Israeli army pulled out from Gaza. It was Monday that day. And, uh, and then the borders were opened just for three days. In that three days, I visited my mother for uh, my first time. Yeah. 
What was the reunion like? The meeting. Uh, no words to express this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I cannot uh, express how can the, this uh, meeting. So let's talk about the Great March of Return and this Facebook post you did where you wrote, what would happen if Palestinians marched nonviolently in large numbers towards the boundary fence with Israel to demand respect for their rights and call attention to the Israeli-imposed blockade that's created hardship for millions of people for more than a decade? Describe the response. Yes. In those early days of January 2018. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, lo I, I love uh, freedom and I hate uh, fences and prisons. Maybe one of the reasons because I was near the fence and I saw the, 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 the house of my mother just 150 meters between me and him and I still. Uh, 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 19 years and I cannot uh, arrive there. So I was more sensitive toward the idea of, of separations and fences. I think the, 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 the borders in general, the fences in general, uh, is, uh, uh, represents, represents a failure, a moral failure, a failure and a political failure. Because the people, all the, peop all the peoples are similar. So we, w w why, why they separated between them? The same people, the same hearts, the same dreams, the same feelings. Uh, so uh, when I visited the fence between us and uh, Israel, and actually 75% of the Palestinians inside Gaza are refugees. That means their origin villages and houses beyond that fence. Then I wrote uh, a poet in that night. Why, 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 why don't we be like the birds? The birds can move freely between the fences without borders. So I, I think I wrote that in my uh, post. I think even birds and foxes and dogs more clever than people than humans because they don't recognize the fences. They can cross the fences. So. Uh, then I uh, I wrote another uh, post, and I I, I will uh, tell something. Uh, I start in uh, in my activity for the March of Return in 2011, not in 2018. In 2011, uh, uh, in in February month, uh, after uh, Hosni Mubarak collapsed in Egypt then we feel uh, high spirit. So me and a group of my friends, we, we, we said we haven't uh, a regime, but we have a cause of return. So let us invite people to protest peacefully and to demand their right to return. And this is what happened in 2011. Uh, we invited people to return, uh, to, to protest for return, and they protest not just in Gaza Strip, in Gaza Strip, in West Bank, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and they tried to return in that day. In 2018, uh, I uh, uh, posted this uh, status, what if 200,000 of Palestinians inside Gaza uh, uh, try to, to break this prison because we are really inside a prison. We are dying. You, you cannot imagine how the people live inside Gaza. Uh, uh, no medicine, no electricity, no jobs, no salaries, uh, no hope. <coughs> so let us, uh, let us try to, to make our, uh, our, uh, uh, our, uh, our voice heard in the world and say th to the world, we want to live. It's our uh, human right to live. It's our uh, human right to break the doors of the prison, the wall of the prison. And how did you come up with the title, The Great March of Return? How? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the March of Return, uh, 
uh, uh, we, we used it, uh, not me only, me and my friends, in 2011, the March of Return. But uh, I add great, because I was imagining in that post, it, uh, it, it, it was, uh, at first, it was like a dream, not, not a practical uh, project. It was like a dream. So I was imagining that all uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees will collect in, in the same day from Lebanon and from Syria, Jordan, and West Bank and Gaza and say that we want to return. This is our, our right. This is the right, uh, our right according to United Nations Resolution 194. And we are peaceful people. So because I was imagining that this step will be great, will be historic, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, refugees will decide to return in one day. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I suggest uh, to, to, to be the, the hashtag uh, Great March of Return. So you're challenging both the right, calling for the right of return and also challenging the siege. Yes. Explain how the Israeli government has responded to this mass protest. Israel uh, is worried about the, the, the peaceful and non-violent struggle. And this is what, what, what we uh, where can, can notice it easily. Not uh, with the beginning of the March of Return, but before, two months before. Since we called the people to, to, to collect and we suggest this idea, uh, Israel made propaganda against this idea and uh, they tried to to create a situation of violence because when we, we, because in that field the field of violence israel can can convince the world that we uh, we protect our security but when uh, when the the world see the people including women including elderly uh, the people and demand their uh, their rights, their normal rights, their human rights. It will be difficult for Israel to to convince to convince the world about the, the reality of its occupation and its apartheid. So Israel tried to kill this idea. Israel, when killed hundreds of unarmed protesters, it that didn't kill them because they were represent any threat against the, uh, against its soldiers uh, their soldiers israel's soldiers were safe and safe but israel tried to kill this idea it tried to 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 silence us to uh, push us toward the violence toward the blood don't uh, try in this field and Israel actually, Israel uh, 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 isn't is uh, interested and it tried to push the situation and push the events toward the violence. I wanted to ask Jihad, that day, March 30th, the beginning of the march, the great march of return, um, where were you and how were you able to see what was taking place? What did it mean to you as a Palestinian living in the United States? Um, I started following the the hashtag and the and the posts that were written uh, about the march and uh, the calls for protest early on. Um, it's because uh, although I'm here, I'm still connected with uh, with uh, the conversation on social media. So um, actually, that was my second day at uh, <laughs> at AFSC, and the day before that uh, was my orientation. And on my way out of the office, I told my colleagues that tomorrow there will be a great march of return in Gaza. We didn't know what the scale of the march would be, um, how many people are going to participate, and w what will that mean for, for us here. Um, I watched from afar um, the people who participate in the march and participated, and some of them were killed or injured. You know, their schoolmates, people from my neighborhood. Um, I'm talking about the the part of Gaza where I'm from, 
um, and watching them go and protest and lose their lives and knowing them personally was a very painful experience for me being here. Um, uh, one of them uh, was Ahmed Al-Adani, who's uh, from my town. Uh, he's, he was a really brilliant and, and, and great person. He, he spent all of his uh, youth that was ended early um, volunteering and leading initiatives in our town and uh, you know working with youth and mentoring youth and uh, leading a lot of uh, activities that aim at improving uh, young people's participation and contribution to their society. Um, and uh, we had like a brief conversation on Facebook just a few days before he was killed. And then, you know, you wake up here um, um, after almost, you know, the, the events almost ended back there because of the time difference. And you open your Facebook and see people writing on the wall of your friend, rest in peace. So that was, a v that was you know, like on, the, on these days, my only wish is that I would wake up from my sleep and I wouldn't see my fr the people I knew gone. It is astounding how many people have been killed or injured. We're talking about, what, over 18,000 people injured? Um, nearly, and you can give us the numbers, is it around 200 people killed? The UN Human Rights Council um, just did a report, hardly got any attention in the United States, talking about the targeting of women, children, the disabled, Razan al Najjar, who you talked about, the volunteer medic, the young woman who was gunned down, 21 years old. Talk about the effect. What point in that was of the Great March of Return was her death? You went, you interviewed people about what happened to her and then went to her funeral in Gaza? Uh, yes, uh, you mean the story of Razan? Yes, uh, uh, I I, uh, uh, I heard about Razan uh, Razan uh, uh, murder after two hours uh, from her, uh, her her killing by Israeli sniper. I was in that day in in Malacca. Uh, east of Gaza, and Razan was in east of Khan Yunis, in south of Gaza Strip. When we, when when the protests were, were were finished in that day, it was Ramadan, where the people uh, uh, fasting. Then I uh, went back to my home, and I was feeling uh, comfortable that there there are no victims today. Uh, but after I. Uh, I uh, arrived my home, then I uh, I follow my Facebook and my Twitter, uh, then I saw uh, tens of people spoke about Razan, and she was very known in in, in, in east of Khan Yunis because she was uh, she was uh, a volunteer and she was she, she had a, a kind heart and she she loved to help people. She was a poor, uh, a poor uh, uh, woman, but uh, but she was uh, uh, she was very uh, very uh, kind woman, uh, and uh, and she she collect uh, money from her pocket to uh, to buy uh, materials to uh, to help the people, the injured people. So there was. Uh, uh, a big anger among the Palestinians because of her killing, and uh, she was known for the Israeli sniper. She was with with white uniform. I visited her family af uh, the day after, and uh, and uh, uh, give uh, give uh, condolences to her mother and her father. Then I I I visited them uh, many times after that. Razan actually she inspired me on my personal level. She, she inspired me, uh, and uh, and ju just today I remembered her last post. Her last post 
because she was killing was I will return to my village, Salama. So I feel I will I will be betrayed if I give up this this right, the right of return, because this is the right that those those victims were killed because of it. We 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 cannot we cannot be able to give up this right. Uh, so Razan inspired me, and uh, because I, I, I feel, I, I saw in her story, she's an angel. She is the sound of a humanity. She is the, 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 the most beautiful thing in humanity. She, she, her soul was pure when her mother asked her, what if you saw an Israeli soldier wounded? She uh, answered, I will help him because my mission is a human. Uh, so yes, she, she's inspired. Uh, she, she, she inspired me. You wrote a piece headlined, Even Angels Are Killed in Palestine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I wrote an article about her in, uh, in uh, a website, Arabi 21. It's... Uh, uh, Arabic uh, known website and I uh, I uh, I wrote other uh, pieces uh, about her your brother was also shot yeah my brother uh, on in on May uh, 14 the day where where uh, uh, the United States government opened its embassy in Jerusalem it was uh, uh, very, uh, it was uh, it was very uh, tense day in Gaza Strip. Israel killed in that day sixty unarmed Palestinians. I was in that day in Gaza, East Gaza, and my family and my brothers were in east of Rafah, uh, south of Gaza Strip. And uh, yeah, my, my brother, while he was standing in the protest. Then an Israeli bullet hit him, his head, from the, the edge. Then the same bullet hit the heart of the person who is beside my brother. So my brother was injured, and the uh, other uh, protester was killed in, uh, by, by the same bullet. And how is your brother today? Today he's good, yeah. Uh, his... Uh, his, uh, the bullet uh, doesn't uh, hit deeply in his head. It's, it just touched his uh, head. So uh, he, he became better later, after many weeks. Mm -hmm. What about jihad, the response in the United States to this overwhelming onslaught against this nonviolent movement? I mean, for long there has been the eternal question of where is the Palestinian Gandhi. And when the Palestinian Gandhi shows at the border, he's shot. Um, you know, many uh, have been writing and uh, articles and, and giving Palestinians ideas about how to, to conduct their struggle in the, in the best ways possible. I remember Thomas Friedman once wrote an article uh, uh, calling on Palestinians to march uh, uh, in, in such a way, um, definitely there was a, um, um, you know, the what we're used to making our story invisible in the media here, in the mainstream media, and uh, uh, adopting talking points that dehumanize Palestinians and dehumanize their experience and does not really um, does not really um, uh, uh, consider Palestinian agency uh, no matter what Palestinians do even in in an action like that that you know it was easy for any journalist or media person to go to the border and see the scale of participation in the march and the the diversity of the activities that people did and and how uh, and how people uh, wanted to show uh, uh, the, the various ways they wanted to contribute to the march. However, um, the discourse here again revolved around that this is a march that is staged by a certain faction and again, uh, if this continues, this will lead to some sort of an existential threat uh, to Israel and so on. 
um, uh, and you know, I, I read really um, a few pieces where people were projecting what their idea is about how people should protest, um, and then you know, using their standards uh, of what a protest looks like to uh, to remove the nonviolent or peaceful or popular. Uh, 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 definition from the March of Returns. So by the virtue of few uh, children throwing rocks or uh, burning a tire or, or, or more, uh, for those writers here or journalists, the March loses its, uh, its popular uh, uh, definition. So th the combination of, of, these, of these factors made the coverage in the US, if there was any, uh, really, one that is not about the, the 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 questions that we we should talk about. It's not about that this march is a, a cry from a, a Gaza Strip that is overwhelmed by a blockade. It's not about a an entire generation of young Palestinians. Those who are 20 years old of them spent the the last 10 years of their lives under blockade. They were 10 when the blockade was imposed. It's not about their experience. It's not about what does it mean for them. It's not about, it, it's always, it's, things are always looked at from an Israeli national security lens. Mm -hmm. uh, what will that mean for Israel? So Palestinian humanity here is not taken, is not taken seriously still in the US, unfortunately. Explain more what this blockade means to the people inside. The UN has called it the largest open air prison in the world, but in your daily life? Yeah. This blockade means uh, no life. Actually, there is no, uh, no human life. Uh, Im imagine the people inside Gaza, uh, the youth, there are, they, they live without the, the, without the basic conditions, conditions for a uh, dignified life. When, th when that person uh, 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 became 35 years old, without work, without job, without hope, he cannot imagine, imagine how, how his future will be. Uh, imagine when, you're, uh, w when, when the electricity cutting off for 16 continuous hours. Imagine when we can imagine because in New York um, years ago there was the this major blackout, um, and it w New York was just completely incapacitated. Yeah, you're yeah. talking about experiencing that every day. Yeah, the, the electricity is cutting off every day. This is one aspect of the of the of the crisis in Gaza. No medicine in Gaza. When uh, no no medical services. When when uh, the, the the person uh, uh, be, uh, where, uh, where was uh, uh, ill, so he uh, he should uh, he should wait long months before he got an Israeli permit to uh, go to hospitals in Jerusalem or in West Bank. And hundreds of ill people were uh, die, dying w uh, while they were, uh, uh, while they were uh, uh, waiting. Uh, uh, the, the people inside Gaza, Gaza is a real, a real prison. It's a very narrow place. When, when you take a car, uh, a car and, uh, uh, and uh, drive, in the uh, in the main street in Gaza Strip called Salah Din, in the middle of Gaza Strip, and connected from the south to the north, when you drive in in, the, in this street and look at east, you will see the Israeli fence on east, and uh, when you uh, from the same point you can see the uh, the coast uh, where Israeli uh, navy ships uh, prevent any people. Uh, uh, to 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 uh, get out or to come in, uh, no 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 economical cycle in Gaza because Israel destroyed hundreds of industrial factories in 2008, then 2011, uh, then 2014, and they prevented uh, entering the materials that allowed Palestinians to uh, active the 
the economical uh, uh, cycle. So now there are hundreds of thousands of youth in Gaza. They cannot get work. Even they cannot uh, travel. They cannot... Uh, 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 and and w w when, when you was a father, you, wa you were a father, and you have children, and your child came, come and ask you to give him, uh, give him money to, to buy a sweet or to buy a toy or, or, or something. You know that the simple dreams for, for children. Or, or, or the, this child uh, wanted to, uh, to, to, to eat a delicious meal on a Friday, as example, a chicken. Then because the, the father is poor, uh, he cannot bring for 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 their uh, their children anything. Uh, it's it's hard to broken to to see your 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 child ask something, and this something is very simple, but you cannot answer them. This poverty, not normal poverty, it's uh, it's caused by systemically Israeli siege and blockade. The Israeli strategy against not just Gaza, against Gaza and against West Bank, is to, to make this, this area uh, 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 unlivable for peoples. Because Israel has a problem with our existence. Israel doesn't want from us to, 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 to exit in, in that land. Because our existence is a problem for Israel. Because it, our existence, our existence reminds Israel that they, they cannot make stability uh, based on our rights and based on our Nakba in 1948. Uh, the Israel, the government of Israel, Netanyahu, who looks like he's about to be indicted himself for corruption, um, according to the Attorney General of Israel, um, says the Great March of Return protests are used by Hamas as a pretext to attack Israel. Your response? Yeah, the reality, uh, the reality respond this claims from Netanyahu. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, we, we speak about hundreds of Palestinian victims, not Israeli victims. We, uh, uh, we see thousands or tens of thousands of Palestinian uh, injured people, not Israeli injured. So this is the uh, the reality. Uh, when Netanyahu and uh, and his allies uh, talked a lot about Hamas, Hamas factions, then they tried to escape from the real problem. The real okay, okay, ignore Hamas and ignore factions. What about the occupation? What about the Palestinian people? What about the right of return? What about cry? What about the crisis of the refugees? This is the key issues. You have made a pilgrimage to one injured person after another, whether in their in the hospital in their homes. Can you describe what this has been like? Hundreds of people have been shot, in addition to those that have been killed. And as you pointed out, nearly 20,000 people have been injured. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, uh, this is uh, add more crisis for the Palestinian people. Uh, some people asked why, why the people inside Gaza uh, continue their protesting even this high cost. The answer, the, respon the response simply because they, ha they haven't other choice. This is their only choice. When you put a person inside a room and prevent food and medicine uh, uh, from him, then he feel he will die. Then he hasn't any choice but knocking the door, uh, trying to shout. This is, this is what the Palestinians make in the march of return. They haven't other, other choice. They are actually dying, and Israel doesn't start kill start killed us uh, 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 from the, the with the beginning of the march of return. Israel killed us when they expelled us from our lands, and made us refugees. 
Then Israel killed us again when, when it occupied our lands. Then they killed us again and again when they made a sad story in every, in every home. In every home there is a sad story. I, uh, I told you before about my personal story, but, but it's just one story from hundreds of thousands of stories in every uh, home in, in Palestine. So we haven't other choices. We cannot, we cannot adapt with uh, occupation. We cannot adapt with depriving us from the freedom. The freedom is the life. We cannot live without freedom. We cannot live without dignity. Jihad. Um, as for, the, for the, those who were injured during the March of Return, um, most of these young people who went to the border were already unemployed and went to the, to the border to, to the separation fence to express their discontent and anger with, the, with their reality. And now they're back uh, uh, to their homes with uh, you know, one less arm or one less leg. And, and this adds a burden on, 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 I mean, imagine being 20 year old or 25 years old and losing your limb just because you went to protest. Th these, are, these are actual uh, tragedies that happen and affect people's lives. And there are dozens of young Palestinians in Gaza who will have to live with this for the, for the, uh, you know, for the rest of their lives. Um, and that, you know, like that brings the question of, what happens to the to the to those who shot those young people, and ha what what can we do to help relieve their pain and 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 be there for them? Because imagine you know some of these people, uh, those who had jobs are unable now to to go back to to do the work that they were doing before, and uh, and those who were already unemployed will never be able to have. Uh, an opportunity to to provide for their families and for themselves. So it's a, it's a real tragedy. So, what is your message when you come here to the United States, and what do you see as the responsibility of people who live here? Yeah, thank you for this question. My message that we we struggle for freedom, we struggle for humanity, for equality for all people. So. It's not our own struggle. It's the struggle of all people who believe in humanity, who believe in justice. We are, all of us, we are partners in this struggle. So the people inside Gaza continue their struggling, their protesting, continuing saying no for occupation, no for aggression. Those people wanted your support your political support your uh, your su your support by by making pressure against the american government american government paid 3.8 billion dollars every year for israeli occupation this money the money of taxpayers means more palestinian victims more means more bullets hit the bodies of its children. Just in the last four weeks, there were four children were killed. Children, four. What's the threat there, the, 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 these children represent against the democratic Israeli state? So uh, uh, this money paid for Israeli government means more apartheid. I cannot imagine how in, 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 in the 21st century where the where the the human values about uh, freedom about human rights at the same time there are be, there are st states based on walls based on uh, 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 on fences based on discrimination uh, against other people so all of us in one struggle let us uh, 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 try and struggle to make this world better, to make this world better by supporting the people who, are, who struggle for freedom and who struggle for uh, justice and punishing 
the states and the governments make occupation and make aggression and make discrimination against people. When the freedom prevails, when the justice prevails, this will be bitter for all, for all people, not just for Palestinians. You're going back, you're hoping to go back to Gaza for the first anniversary of the Great March of Return. What are the plans for March 30th? Yeah, uh, the, the, march is, uh, the March of Return is not my, uh, now it's not my own uh, project. It's a popular choice. So uh, uh, anyway, it, it's continuing. As, uh, the people uh, is, are continuing in this march because it's their only choice to struggle for freedom and to, and to struggle for their uh, human rights. Yes, I hope I will go back soon to uh, Gaza to be with these people, to be, to be with these victims, to share with them in the protesting and to share with them in in their uh, their uh, uh, their actions and their struggle for the freedom and jihad here gaza unlock the project of afsc what are the issues that you're working on here we're mostly working on um building connections between Palestinians in, in Gaza and other Palestinians and also with, uh, with the outside world by uh, highlighting the stories of, uh, the personal stories of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Um, we keep hearing about numbers, we keep hearing about percentages of Palestinians who are unemployed or impoverished or this percentage of Palestinians live under poverty lines and so on. But uh, what, uh, what, what is lost in, in, in this statistical com, com, uh, language is, uh, are, the, are the stories of people who suffer. So we will continue to raise awareness. We will continue to uh, bring and highlight these stories to uh, American audience. For example, you know, over the, the past two years, um, we did something uh, called the strawberry survey, where we would go to farmers markets, for example, and ask people if they knew that the, the, that uh, strawberry uh, is a produce of Gaza, and then people would say no, and then we will ask them, uh, and then we will ask them what do they know about Gaza, and we would engage with them. So you know these simple things, in addition to um, organizing speaking tours, inviting people from from Gaza. Ahmed is not the first. Palestinian from Gaza, who AFSC has invited. We invited uh, uh, an another writer before. Um, we also are about to uh, publish a collection of essays uh, by Palestinian, young Palestinians from Gaza uh, titled My Life Under Blockade. That was a writing competition that, uh, that AFSC organized uh, a few months ago. We invited Palestin young Palestinians to write about their experiences in English. And we actually received 42 excellent uh, essays. And the, and the booklet will be out soon. And what was each of your response? You're here in the United States for the first time, and you're here in the midst of a great controversy over the last few weeks, Ilhan Omar, raising the issue of US support for Israel. Ultimately, uh, though the Democratic leadership of the House of Representatives wanted to pass a resolution not specifically naming her, but condemning anti-Semitism, the new Congress fought back. And in the end, it condemned anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, white supremacy, and other forms of hate. Um, Ilhan Omar herself, the first covered woman in the woman wearing a hijab in Congress, one of two Muslim, first Muslim Congresswomen in Congress, um, together with Andre Carson and Rashida Tlaib, um, wrote a piece. Uh, talking about how proud she was to be in a Congress that for the first time ever passed a resolution against Islamophobia. What has that been like for you to see as you travel through the United States? Yeah, uh, I can say that the, the real challenge for the United States and for all the world uh, is the injustice, is the discrimination, is the incubation. This make people more uh, uh, more troubled, make people un un 
unstable stable so uh, the 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 interest of the united states to support humanity to support uh, uh, to support freedom everywhere everywhere with palestine not everywhere but palestine, but palestine. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, so i i i, th I think we, we we should the the people here the people here who believe in justice and believe in uh, humanity uh, they should make a situation this situation uh, 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 make the make the american policies closer than to the rights of peoples and we can succeed just before uh, just uh, two days before uh, uh, i i heard uh, uh, a happy uh, a good news about uh, the about the american policy in in yemen how how, how can we ach how, how this achieved this achieved by by the efforts of the people here who believe in, 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 in justice and who believe in humanity. So this gave us uh, hope to continue in this uh, way. And of course, sure, we will make more progress in this direction. As we wrap up, I want to, as we wrap up let me ask you about that issue of hope and what gives you hope considering what you're facing today and what you see as the solution to the situation in Gaza and the occupied territories and let me put that question to both of you the final question yeah the solution is uh, is justice the, sh the solution is the people take their t t take their, their their rights uh, I believe in equality. We struggle for equality, and Israel say we we, we, we don't want it. Uh, want equality. Netanyahu just uh, a few days before before a few days he said Israel as a state just for Jewish people, not for all of its citizens. Of course, we respect Jewish people, Jewish people, and we haven't a problem with Jewish people. Our problem with discrimination, our problem with expulsion and occupation. So the solution is simple, that make a country based on humanity, based on equality, the Palestinians can take their normal rights, including the right of return for refugees, for millions of refugees, they are still their return since 70 years until now, and give the israelis safe security and peace i met a lot of uh, jewish people here and i respect respect them some of them said to me uh, there is a deep uh, fear if the palestinian refugees go back to their homes i said to them that if you want security if you want to be safe then safety achieved by justice, not by injustice. So this solution is uh, 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 all, the, all the parts and all the, uh, the, the, the groups will be uh, win in this solution. Uh, uh, this solution will end the Palestinian tragedy and at the same time, we'll liberate Israelis, we'll liberate them from the fences, we'll re liberate them from the walls, we'll liberate them from the fear. You cannot stay inside the prisons and inside walls forever. Let us end this, and the solution is very simple. The solution is to achieve the justice and equality for all people, because they, they are humans, not because of their religion or their race or other things. And Jihad, your final comment. Um, I mean, what else is to be said besides what Ahmed said? I think um, uh, um, I won't give a solution in a couple minutes, but I think in any future thinking about um, uh, addressing the reality uh, uh, in, in our homeland, 
um, there has to be a recognition of Palestinian rights and Palestinian narrative and the Palestinian connection to the land. Palestinians existed on that land for centuries. They they celebrated their culture, their their uh, you know their folklore. Their they contributed with so much to the world, and to to the Arab world, and to the uh, to to the world in general. And and I think the the the, the starting point. Sh one of them should be recognizing what this land means for us as Palestinians beyond the legal terms. There, there is so much that connects us to our land, and perhaps rager is not deemed a crime according to international law, but this is what we have been suffering from. Ending the erasure of the Palestinian connection, ending the, the erasure of the Palestinian narrative uh, will contribute to um, starting really constructive conversations for a better future. And, and also, we, we ask ourselves if the existing frameworks that have been internationally imposed uh, through certain countries and through certain players in the international community did not work, so what's next? So these, are, these questions are, I think, the, going to be the most important questions that will face us and Palestinians and Israelis and all those who are concerned with the reality back there. And I think we need to start addressing these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. so much. Oh, okay. All right, a uh, couple announcements before people leave. Um, I would like to remind ourselves of the um, uh, Gaza appeal that I mentioned earlier in my, in my introduction. Uh, AFSC.org slash give to Gaza. It's, uh, it's an appeal to donate and contribute to helping Palestinian elderly in the Gaza Strip who do not receive uh, uh, aid and assistance. And um, if for those who have cell phones, uh, if you are interested, uh, you, if you text the word Gaza to the number 91990, you will receive a link that will uh, connect you to a form in which you can write directly to your member of Congress asking them to help end the blockade on the Gaza Strip. So text GAZA to 99, sorry, 91990, 91990, and send GAZA in the text. Thank you so much. <laughs>